Well, I'm feeling pretty good today because my Tigers didn't lose yesterday. The truth is they didn't play yesterday. But in light of the circumstances, I'm choosing to consider that a blessing this week. I am. Now, they were scheduled to play, but their opponent um, actually had a COVID spike And so the game was postponed until a later date, all right? It's kind of like the Chiefs, right? The Chiefs were scheduled to play Thursday, again, due to some COVID issues. Um, Now it is postponed until tomorrow at like 4 o'clock or something weird like that, right? Now I'm saying that's just sports right now. And in fact, that's just life right now because we're all having to figure out how to just make the schedule. You try to, you try to schedule things, but then we're going to see what adjustments have to be made, and then we're just going to be flexible, right? Here's what I want to talk about today. There are some decisions in life, though, trying to decide what to do, trying to schedule this and that, that honestly, it feels like if you don't get it right the first time, there are kind of some big consequences associated with that. It feels like there are some things in life that if you have to make an adjustment later, it's just a bigger price that it feels like you have to pay. Now, I'm not talking about scheduling a ball game. I'm not, I'm not talking about what's for dinner. I'm not talking about what movie are we going to watch. I'm talking about things like, some of you had to ask the question, like, should I go to college now? Or do something different? And I'm saying, come on, if you change the, later, you can But there's a part of you that just goes, man, time is precious and I don't want to waste my time with the wrong decision. Uh, What college should I go to? This one or this one? Right? Should I get married? That's kind of a big one. And then who should I marry? Uh, When should we have kids? Where should we live? Uh, Should we buy this house or that house? Should I take this job or that job? When should I retire? It feels like there's a pressure attached to those kinds of decisions that have to be made. And and then, on top of that, there's the pressure of what other people think when you end up making that decision. It's like, what what are my friends going to think when I tell them this is what I'm going to do? What are my parents going to think? What are my my kids going to think? What's my spouse going to think? And then... For those of you who have chosen to follow Jesus, come on, what we said when we chose to follow him was, Jesus, you are the king of my life, and I want you making the decisions in my life. So here's what I'm telling you. I have observed that one of the most paralyzing questions for many people is this question. What is God's will for my life. What is God's will for my life? So we have a decision that needs to be made. Should I, should I take this job or this job? And when that, when that moment comes, we pick up the Bible and we start to read it right from, from cover to cover. We're searching for every text that has anything to say about a job. And, and, and we can't find the exact verse that lists both of the jobs that we're trying to figure out if we're supposed to take. And so I, I think I know what I'm supposed to do. But my question is, God, did I really hear you right? And so I, I start asking for signs because if I get get this wrong and I go to the wrong school or I take the wrong job or I live in the wrong city or I marry the wrong girl, it feels heavy. Well, today, my mission is to hopefully help us with some of this as we look at one of the biggest decisions that is recorded in scripture, I want to help you see how they made that and how it can help us. So welcome. I'm glad you're here today. 
Really want to thank everybody for being a part of this. I want to welcome our folks who are online. I uh, want to welcome all of our campuses. And uh, specifically today, many of you know, through this whole COVID thing, just sort of one by one, we have reopened gatherings at each campus. Well, today, um, just a special shout out to the Lewisburg campus because today is their first gathering back again together. So woohoo, we're glad that everybody is, uh, is uh, gathering again. So this year, we've been reading through the Bible together. And I haven't said this in a while, but we call it being on the same page, right? Because literally, we're, we're on the same page of Scripture as we're reading through it together. Um, I want to invite you that even if you have not been a part of that up until now, I want to invite you to join us. If you go online, go to the website, click on sermons or podcast at the very top of that page, you will see a place where you can either download an app that will help you walk through this with us, or there's actually a place where you can print out the, the dated list of what we're reading each week. You say, well, I, I've missed all that's before it. Okay, maybe, maybe next year you can get the rest of it, but this is a great time for you to just pick it up and join in with us because we're at a place in the Bible where we are seeing God do some amazing, amazing stuff, all right? This week, we saw Paul and Barnabas. They're they're sent out from the church at Antioch. It's it's what in in Bible study is often called Paul's first missionary journey, And, and things like Paul walks into Lystra. He's telling them the good news about Jesus. They pick up a bunch of rocks and start throwing them at Paul to, to the point that, that literally they drag him out of the city. A, a lot of scholars think that maybe Paul is even dead at this point. The disciples gather around him. He gets back up and walks right back into the same city declaring the good news of Jesus. That's like something out of a movie, right? I'm hearing the rocky theme in the background as Paul is walking back into Lystra. Crazy stories, man, of what God is doing. Well, Paul and Barnabas get about 500 miles away, and then they loop back to Antioch. And that's where I want to pick up our story today. Acts chapter 15, verse 1, reads this way. It says, certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. Now here's the big deal about the decision that they got to make. It's a question of how can a person be right with God? What's required? And it's such a big deal that it says even among these believers, there is a sharp dispute that is taking place here. And they decide to call a meeting in Jerusalem, have the leaders gather, and let's figure out the answer to this decision that we have to make. So they gather And in verse 5, we're going to pick it up. It says this. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Now, I'm going to explain it to you, but here's the equation that they're trying to figure out. Jesus plus what? equals salvation. Okay, that's kind of a big deal. Jesus plus what makes a person right with God? They're saying, is it Jesus plus the law? And if it is Jesus plus the law, then which laws? Like, is it Jesus plus which rules do you have to keep? Now, here's the background. You're dealing with a bunch of Jews who have grown up strictly obeying God's law. God gave them what we call the moral law. When you think about moral law, you think about the Ten Commandments. So don't lie, don't steal, right? Don't commit murder, don't don't commit adultery, honor your parents. That's the moral law. But God also gave them what we sometimes refer to as ritual law. 
In other words, God gave his people, the Jews, some, some external commands, if you will, to distinguish them from the other peoples around them, uh, things like circumcision, and that's a whole conversation that we're not going to have today, um, ceremonial washing, uh, eat certain foods but not other foods. But here's what's happened. Now we got Gentiles, who, which means they're not Jews, they didn't grow up with this history of the law. And, 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 and so these Gentiles are wanting to say, hey, we, we know God too. We, we, we can be right with God too. But the question is, do they have to keep the Jewish laws like God had told the Jews to or not? Well, there's a big old conversation that happens. The apostle Peter, for example, speaks and one of the statements he makes is, why would we require them, the Gentiles, to do what we couldn't even do? And his point is, we didn't keep the law. And he helps them to understand that the point of the law was actually to make it clear, a part of its point, that, that none of us can keep the, the law. The law actually points us to the fact that we need Jesus. He's the only way. So more conversation happens, and eventually... Eventually, James makes this statement in verse 19. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. And I'm telling you, that is a great evaluation for our church and every church. It should be scary for any church to consider making it more difficult difficult than God does for people to get to him. I'm going to say that again. It should be scary for us to consider making it more difficult than God does for people to get to him. So here's their decision, verse 28. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. And then he gives them these requirements. You are to abstain from food, sacrifice to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. You will do well to avoid these things. Now, I'm giving you the cliff notes because I'm trying to get to a specific piece here. But here's what I want you to understand. James is not suddenly saying it's Jesus plus these things that make you right with God. They settle the answer. The decision is it is Jesus and it is Jesus alone. Nobody can earn a right relationship with God. Nobody completely gets, gets the law. It is Jesus, his grace, through faith in him. But what, what James says here is, look, it's Jesus and him alone. So here's what I want you to consider. Some of you are Jews and you come from this background of what God has called you to, to, to be a part of and not. Some of you are Gentiles and that hasn't been a part of your life. I want you to consider your other brothers and sisters at the table. And don't do anything that would rob them of being able to enjoy this fellowship together with you. In other words, you know Jesus has forgiven you. By his grace, he has brought you into his family. He has loved you in a way that nobody ever did. Therefore, why don't you love your brother the same way? To say, I'm for you, I choose to serve you, and if there is something that would cause you to stumble or cause you to grow weary or cause you to lose heart, then I'm just not going to do that. That's selfless. And at the end of this chapter, it, it, it clearly says the people read it and they were glad for its encouraging message. In other words, the Gentiles weren't going, what do you mean we got to keep some of those? That's not their view. They're not seeing it as a requirement for being right with God. They're seeing it as an act of love that they're willing to do so because they love their Jewish brothers and sisters. What a decision and what an outcome because I'm telling you that decision set the course of Christianity for the, for the next 2,000 years. This is a big deal about is the good news of Jesus really the good news that it's by his grace or is it his grace plus something? This is a big deal. How did they know it was the right decision? 
I'm going to take you back to verse 28. I'm going to show you something that I think most of us just tend to gloss right by, right over. Verse 28, this is their response. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So he says, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. How freeing does that sound? Like, I, I mean, no eating extra fortune cookies, right? Because you're hoping there's something in there that's going to give you some direction, right? No, no shaking the, the, the magic eight ball. Remember those things, right? And, and it's like shake it again if you don't get the answer you want, right? And you just, you just keep shaking the, the magic eight ball or how many leaves are on the clover or you're counting off one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. And when you get to 10 Mississippi, you open your eyes. And if the, if the, if the traffic light is green, it means yes. And if it's red, it means no as to whether or not you should date that girl. And you laugh, but I'm being pretty serious. We get weird when it comes to trying to make decisions that suddenly feels like they carry a lot of weight. And we want to know the right thing to do, but we don't know what to do. So today, I want us, in the time we got left, to look at this little phrase How do you know if it's good to the Spirit? And how do you know if it's good to you? Because come on, I'm saying I don't know of a decision in the Bible that's bigger than that decision they had to make. Their answer is it's good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Hopefully, if we can learn this, we will stop losing our minds every time we have to make a decision that we feel is weighty. So when we talk about good to the Spirit, what what we're really talking about here is what's God's will for my life. That's the same thing, all right? The question, what is God's will for my life? We're going, okay, what is good to the Spirit of God? I'm about to give you a handful of verses that I'm going to encourage you to write down. I'm going to encourage you to record them somehow, get your phone out, right? Not, not too many times are they encouraging you to get your phone out in church. I encourage you to get your phone out in church because you got it out anyway. That way you don't have to text in your pocket. You just go ahead, get your phone out and, and go to notes and take a few notes. If you, if you like pen and paper and old school, that, that's fine too. But I encourage you to write it down because look, 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 look. At some point in your life, regardless of where you are with God right now, At some point in your life, you're going to face a decision that you feel so much pressure to get right, you're even going to be willing to ask God. And you're going to want to know what he actually thinks. I want to help you with that. So, here's the first text that I encourage you to write down. 1 Peter, or 2 Peter, rather, chapter 3. Verse 9, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting. There are some translations that, that we read that literally translate it not willing. So, okay, this is, this is God's will. What is God's will for my life? Not willing anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Repentance means to turn. And in this case, it means to turn to Jesus. And the word that I would encourage you to write down by this text is the word salvation. It's the word salvation. The Bible tells us clearly that being right with God is not about Jesus plus this, 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 this. It's about repentance and faith in Jesus. It is a turning to Jesus and entrusting my life to him. So here's what I want you to know. The first aspect of what this verse says is it is God's will. God desires what he wants is for you to be connected to him. But then to also understand when you do that it is also his desire that everyone is connected to him. 
So here's what I want you to see. Whatever decision you need to make, this is one of those things that we know from Scripture that decision, should I do this, should I do this, should I, should I buy this, should I do this, that decision falls within the will of God that all would be connected to him. So here's how I want you to see this today. If, if I owned them, what I would actually have brought today were, were like guardrails. You know what guardrails are like on the side of the road? right? They're, they're by ditches or, you know, places you got guardrails. I don't own any guardrails. I got these. So we're going to kind of use these to represent some guardrails today. They are barriers. They serve the point. And, and the point is, I want you to see the difference it makes when you make a decision within the framework, within the guardrails of what you know to be the will of God. So whatever decision I'm trying to make, one thing I know, God is always about people getting connected to him. So my question is, how does this thing that I want to know, I got a decision to make, and I'm saying, God, what do you, what do you want me to make? My decision is not bigger than the will of God in wanting people to be connected to him, my decision fits within this parameter of God's great desire for people to know him. Now, I'm not talking about bribing God with this. You say, what do you mean? Here's what it looks like. God, we really want this house. God, we really want this house. God, we, we, this, this house is so nice. We would, and God, if you, if you would so see fit to give us this house, God, we will have a life team in our house. God, it, it would have an, actually, we will have two life teams in our house. God, we, we will do it on Tuesday and on Thursday because there was so much more space than we had. And God, I know that your heart is for people to be connected. Don't do that. He knows what you're doing. I'm not talking about bribing or trying to bribe God with those things. I'm talking about the reality that whatever the decision is, it falls within what God wants. And that fits within him wanting people to be connected. Okay? So everything I give you in these verses fit within those guardrails. For example, second one, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17 Here's how it reads. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. That pretty clear? Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So if the first word with the first text was the word salvation, the word I would attach to this one as you're taking notes is Spirit-filled. Spirit-filled. What is God's will? That I be Spirit-filled is what he calls it. What does that mean? It's talking about God empowering your life, that, that God impacts the, the world through your life. Now, now, here's what he's saying. Look, wine can impact your life. He gives the example, especially if you drink too much of it. If you drink too much wine, that wine has control of you. And it leads to a place that's not good. But he says, if you are instead filled up with the Spirit of God, and if he, God's Spirit, controls your life, it's like his, the, the wind that fills the, the sails of a ship. It's what moves that ship forward with power in life. Now, you already belong to him. When you, when you called out to him by grace through faith, you belong to him. But, but daily, this is saying, God, I, I'm, I'm depending on you. Daily, God, I'm leaning into you. God, it, d decisions that have to be made, actions of my life, I want all that empowered by you. By the way, side note, you're reading through Acts right now, if you're reading together, through the greatest evidence in the book of Acts of being filled with the Spirit of God is they are boldly proclaiming the good news of Jesus. That's the greatest evidence. People like Paul walk into Lystra. 
They throw rocks at him till they think he's dead. He gets back up, walks back into the same city, and declares the same good news. That is not human. That is supernatural, spirit-filled. I want you to see there is a difference of making a decision. Should I buy this? Should I buy this? Should I go here? Should I go here? Should, should Should it be? There's a difference in making that decision. When you are making it within the guardrails of consistently saying, God, I'm dependent on you. God, I need to be empowered by you. God, I recognize it's you. Okay? Third, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. This one's, I mean, it is God's will. Don't you love it when it's vague, right? Don't you love it when Scripture's vague? It's not vague. He goes, this is God's will that you should be sanctified is the word that he used. And then he goes on to say that you should avoid sexual immorality. The word that I would attach to this text is the word sanctified. What does that mean? Sanctified is simply a word that refers to the process of Jesus making you to look more and more like him. It's sanctified. Working in your life that you will become more and more like him. It is to say daily, here we go, daily, God, I want to walk within this framework that I, I, am, I am expecting today, God, I want, I want you to make my heart more like yours. God, today I want you to shape my actions to be more like yours. God, I, I know that this, whatever the answer may be, this is an opportunity for you to work in my life that I will be more like you. Therefore, Sexual sin? No. No. Because I'm realizing that's selfish. I could be hurting someone else too. That's not what the heart of the king that I serve looks like. That, that's, that's not how he loves He gives a gift like sex, but it is to be used within those guardrails. It becomes something very beautiful, something very powerful, but outside of those guardrails. No. My decision and what God wants is within that framework. Let's keep going. 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 3. We got more. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, right? So we sing a song, right? He, hope is alive, right? He says, I, I want you to be ready when, as you have opportunity, but we often forget the context of what he's saying here. Do this with gentleness and respect. Well, why would I have to do this with gentleness and respect? Keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. In other words, the reason you are speaking here is because people are attacking you. And this is where he makes it clear. For it's better, if it's God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. In other words, here's what I want you to consider. Sometimes, sometimes it is his will for suffering. Now, now I, don't, I don't mean it's his will to make you suffer to pay a price. He suffered to pay your price. But sometimes in life, you find yourself in circumstances that you follow Jesus exactly how he calls you to follow, and you are called out of that. It is God's will that you suffer well. I say this often, and I hope you hear me. I don't know how people can read the Bible 
and I kind of do. I, I, should, I don't know how people can read the whole Bible and walk away with a determination that if you follow Jesus, your whole life is going to just suddenly be perfect, easier, wealthier, healthier. I don't, I don't know how people actually read the whole Bible and walk away and go, and if you trust Jesus, you're going to be healthier. If you trust Jesus, you're going to be wealthier. I don't know how they do that because that's, that's not what it says. It's not what it says. So when I'm making decisions... And I need to know this or that. Most of the time when I'm making decisions, I'm admitting to you, what I really want is, God, can we make the decision here that makes my life most comfortable? God, can we make the decision here that, that brings the least amount of, of chaos or confusion? God, can, can we make a decision here that's healthier and wealthier and easier for me? And what we're reminded is that instead... When I'm trying to make a decision, a part of the guardrails, a part of what I need my my mind and my heart to consider is that sometimes it is the will of God that there is suffering, but that he empowers us to suffer well, and that out of suffering well, his greatness can be seen, and sometimes even people get connected to him by how you suffered through. My decision, what God wants, fits within that. One more. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Well, I don't know what God's will is. Well, a part of his will is that, that those who belong to him ought to be the most grateful people on the planet. The words I would attach to this one is saying thanks. Saying thanks. When you don't get something, do you recognize what you still have? Because that's the hard part. And it's like, I, I I really want this. God, I need to make a decision. Should I have this? And what I really mean is I want this, and I'm trying to talk God into giving me this. If if I don't get it. Do I realize what I still have? That I may not be comfortable, but I have the comforter. And my circumstances presently may not be peaceful, but I got the Prince of Peace. After an election, I may not trust the president, but I trust the King of Kings. I, I could lose the roof over my head, but nobody can take the place that's being prepared for me in heaven. My soul is secure, my hope is alive, and nothing can separate me from his love. When you learn to be thankful, saying thanks often, it affects your view of eternity. It suddenly makes everything so much bigger and broader than just my decision that needs to be made No, my decision fits within what God's want. It it wants, it fits within those guardrails. Now, here's here's where we go. Five times I just showed you where the Bible clearly says God's will is. God's will is. Right? Acts chapter 15, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. He's going, this is what this is what is good to him. But here's, here's where we go. Okay, Jeff, I just want to know who I'm supposed to marry. Okay, I get it. God, God wants people to be connected to him, and he wants people looking more like him, and, and, and right, he, he wants us to, sometimes we got to suffer well, and we go, I just want to know if I'm supposed to buy this house or this house. In other words, most of us spend most of our time not with it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. We want to know what seems good to us. Like, I just, I just want to know the answer. I just want to know the answer. And, and here's what I want to encourage you to see. Answers from God for the decisions of your life are not acquired like a vending machine. 
where you suddenly pay up and get an answer. Those answers come from the connection with him that he made possible and that he wants for every single one of us. So here's what I've learned and here's what I'm still learning. When my life is consistently walking within the guardrails that God has called me to, so okay, Every day, every day, God, no matter what happens today, no matter what decisions have to be made today, no matter what I face today, what I know, today, God, your heart is about people meeting you. Your heart is about people connecting you. You're going to do things specifically that I get to be a part of where, where it connects the hearts of people more to you than they have before. You're going to give them that opportunity. And, and, and God, I know that every day I, I want to wake up and go, God, this is about you filling me. I, I want your power. I don't want to pretend like I'm in control. My goodness, if there ever should be a season of our lives when we are convinced we are not in control, it should be this one. God, I want you to fill my, my, my life. I want you to empower me. God, you be that wind that just moves my life forward. God, God I, I want you Today, I know you're going to do some things that make my heart look more like yours. So, God, I want to see them. I, I want to see where I'm, where I'm outside of those boundaries. I, I want you to grow me up, right? When, when I'm living those, those perspectives in terms of this is what God's will is, here's what I've learned. Sometimes you're going to see very, very clearly a wrong decision because it falls outside of those guidelines. It'll just be clear, this is sin, and I do not need to be attached to this. There are other times that neither one of those things is sin, but because you're close to the heart of God, you will begin to recognize, I, I, God's spirit speaks to your spirit. It seemed good to the spirit, and to, I think this is the direction that God's calling me. And the reason I think so is because I, I am walking this out with him on a regular basis, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm talking with him, and he's talking with me, and I, I can see it. And, and then I'm going to tell you this, too. I think there are moments that there is incredible freedom within these guardrails where there are two decisions that need to be made. Neither one of those decisions, right, are sinful. And I think there are moments that God gives a freedom and he goes, what do you want to do? What do you want, which, which one do you want to do? And that freaks people out. Like, no, I just want an answer. Well, he just gave it to you. He said, which, which one do you want to do? Come on, do we not recognize that God is big enough in the whole scope of this, that there are moments, I mean, he gives us decisions to make and opportunities to make choices. I'm telling you, though, when you are living within those guardrails, man, the pressure, the pressure diminishes because on a regular basis, you are given this glimpse of the bigness of God and you're reminded of how he loves and how far he will go to connect and to protect. And in that relationship, the specifics tend to come. But they're not acquired like a vending machine. They're acquired out of a relationship with the God who went to an extraordinary distance to allow you to be connected to him. Maybe you're saying today, Jeff, this is the problem with Christianity. It's guardrails. It's barriers. I, this is why I don't say yes to Jesus because it's all about what I cannot do, right? It's all about what I, where I cannot choose and I'm saying, I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I have come to realize when I am traveling where there are guardrails, let's say up a mountain, it's a good place for guardrails. The only reason that I will complain about the guardrails being there are because I do not perceive the cliff below the only reason I'll complain, why are there guardrails blocking my view? Is because I don't perceive the cliff below. 
And I'm telling you that every guardrail that God ever puts in place, it is not to prohibit you from life. It is to move you forward to life. When I walk within the guardrails driving up that mountain, the higher I get, suddenly you come to this lookout point along the way and it's like, oh my Now I can see how big God is, and now I can see the beauty of life that he has created. But man, if there weren't guardrails, too many places along this journey, down the mountain I go. I'm telling you, these are not guardrails that prohibit your life. They are actually guardrails that give you life. A God who wants to work in you so extraordinarily. And if you will walk with him, there are answers too. He cares. He cares. So here's what I want to do as we close out today. I I want to just give you a little bit of time to talk to him, maybe process with him. And so one more time, I'm going to encourage you to get your phone out if you haven't already because I want, to, I want you to jot some things down. I want you to, as we're going to, we're going to call this praying, but your eyes can be open and, and you can be typing a little bit because I'm going to throw some things in front of you. I'm actually going to run the list backwards that we just went through. And I want you to just maybe jot down a word or two that later you can go back to and continue this conversation with God. So for example... Let's say that right now you're having difficulty saying thanks to God. Right now, maybe your heart is overwhelmed with some things that have happened that are not good, and right now most of your focus is on what is not good. Maybe, maybe even there's a bitterness that's grown up in your heart instead of gratitude. Here's, here's where I just want you to start right now. As we bow before our God, I want you to just start typing, writing, whatever you got right now, just a few things that you're thankful for. This is no trick question. It could be as simple as, man, does it feel good outside today. A little cooler, change in the weather. The leaves are starting to change. Man, I love when God does that stuff. Thank him for it. Maybe it's to thank him for a close friend that you were reminded of this week or you're thankful for your family, relationships in some way. I will encourage you right now, take a second, and I want you to just quickly jot down, let's say five things. Can you do that quick? Five things. What comes to your mind that you're saying thanks to God? A little later today, you pick when it is. Maybe it's at lunch. Maybe it's right as you settle in to watch a ball game or something today. I encourage you to add five more things to your list. Add five more at that point. And then maybe tonight before you go to bed, add five more. And can I tell you, if you're willing to start to do that with God during a day on a regular basis, you will be amazed at what he starts to work in your heart. Second, maybe some of you are going through some suffering right now, hard stuff, and suffering well becomes key if you're going to do what God wants you to do. Here's here's what I'm, I'm begging you to take God up on. Bring other people into that. If what you're going through, nobody else knows about, if what you're going through, you don't have some people with you who can help you battle, then I'm encouraging you to bring somebody into that. What is it that you're going through? I encourage you to write it down. What's the thing that just comes most to your heart? And then who could it be that you need to take a step in saying, hey, would would you help pray for me? You can do that today. Those of you who are at campuses, there are campus pastors there at each place here that are willing to pray for you before you leave. If you're online, we encourage you to shoot us an email. 
What, what are you going through? What are you struggling with? We'd be honored to join with you in praying through that hardship right now. Or maybe it's somebody else that you trust. God says, bring them in. Third, what is it right now, an area of your life where you know you don't look like Jesus, but he wants you to? (laughs) And you're pushing back against what he's trying to craft in you. I want to encourage you, this is between you and him. Take a minute, confess it to him, type it down, write it down, confess it to him, and ask him to help you to want to. And then maybe it's a question about being spirit-filled. Maybe um, right now you're still trying to control that thing. And today's the day where it's time for you to simply type surrender. Write down what it is and just surrender. And ask him to help you to want to. And speaking of surrender... If you have never, ever placed your faith in Jesus and seen him save you from sin, I want you to know that can happen right now. That connection begins when you say, Jesus, I give you my life. Jesus, the best, I know how I want to make you king. I believe you died for me and you rose again. I ask you to save me and I want to follow you. Listen, it's not about magic words. It's about your heart that calls out to him and surrenders and believes. I want to encourage you that if you take that step today, whether at one of our campuses or online, I want to encourage you to let somebody know. Somebody that you know follows Jesus, I'd be honored. You you let me know. I I, I would love to just, even this week, to just be praying for you. But you need to let somebody know because we don't walk this alone. God, I thank you I thank you for a design that once we really get a glimpse of how this works, God, you don't let us settle for anything less than you. I'm grateful, God, this is, this is not like a vending machine. I'm grateful that this is not about how much can we pay in order to get our answers, God. I'm grateful that the way, the only way, is you. So God, I pray for your people. God, I pray that you would give us a wisdom to to begin to walk each day within those guardrails of seeing how you see life, how you see this world. God, that out of there, we find the answers that we look for. God, out of that place in our heart, God, we begin to sense the direction of your spirit, your guidance. God, I ask that you you would grow our relationships to such a place that we know your voice. And thank you for not allowing us to settle for anything else. Thank you for life in you. May we know your will in our lives. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.